All right, everyone, we're getting back to it, and we're starting one of my favorite units where we talk about single subjects designs. Now, when I say single subject designs, what I mean is that these are the types of, of designs where typically we have few participants. Often we're talking about a design where people are their own control group, but the, that name single subject can be a little bit misleading. I'm going to show you some designs where actually we're looking at the, the behavior of multiple participants. So sometimes behavior analysts call single subject designs time series designs, which perhaps is a little bit more accurate because we're looking at the behavior of a or a few participants over time. So when we're talking about experimental control, let's go back for just a second. When we're talking about experimental control, remember that's our confidence in the cause effect relationship of our intervention, that we, we are confident that our intervention and only our intervention, not some extraneous variable, not some third variable, was the cause of that change that we saw in the dependent variable. Another way of saying this is that the behavior changed when and only when the independent variable was put into place. And I want to say that one more time because this is very important. Experimental control essentially means the behavior changes when and only when the independent variable is put into place. In this particular course, we're going to talk about three major types of designs. Uh, the three that are covered by Miller are comparison designs, sometimes known as A-B designs, a reversal design, or an ABAB -A -B design, and a multiple baseline design. Now, I am going to introduce you to a more advanced, more complex experimental design in a moment. But for the most part, these are very, very simple experimental designs that can show you whether or not you see a change in the dependent variable. On the very simplest level, a comparison design, and you'll have to forgive me here because the slides do get a little bit messed up. We do lose some numbers on the y-axis or the left axis, the one that goes up and down. A comparison design shows you what happens to behavior in a baseline condition. Baseline is a condition where there is no experimental manipulation. We're talking about behavior under naturalistic conditions. So we see behavior before and after an intervention is put into place. So imagine that we're looking at the behavior here of this client and we want to see what the effect of the intervention is. So maybe Janet wants to see if Johnny is going to read more books when she gives him a small reward every time he reads a new book. In this particular case, we see that in the baseline condition, the number of books read across time was probably one, or excuse me, zero, then one in the next observation, two in the third observation, one, one, and then zero. So we saw it increase and then it came back down. That's the baseline condition. And then in the reward condition, we saw, and I'm, I'm guessing on these numbers here, six, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven. So an increase, pretty powerful demonstration that the number of books being read increased. Is this change due to this reward? Or is it due to something else? Now, in a comparison design, it's very difficult to tell. And a comparison design of all of the single subjects design is a very weak design. The problem is that it shows you what happened before and after treatment. And it can be really good because you can see what happens as a result of the treatment. But remember that we need to demonstrate that the behavior changes when the treatment is put into place and only when the treatment is in place. A comparison design cannot rule out confounding variables because a comparison design cannot account for the fact that there could have been another variable that happened right at the start of treatment that we may not know about. So for instance, story time, uh, I am a woman of a certain age. And when I was growing up, when I was coming up through elementary school, uh, there was a program called Book It right? Where if you read these little books and you kept track of all of your books, then you could go in and you could trade in uh, your book it menu. You, your teacher would sign off that you read your books. I could trade that in and get a small pan pizza from Pizza Hut. And God, did I love that program because I like to read anyway, but oh, you read and then you get pizzas. It's the best day ever. In this particular case, what if what happened was someone was trying to reward that client 
And at the same time that they decided they're going to do a reward program, their teacher at school also said, we're going to do the Book It program. That's the problem with comparison designs. There's some weaknesses here. We know that we saw the behavior increase, but we cannot say that our intervention and only our intervention was the cause of that change because there's this thing called a time difference. Something else could have happened at the same time that could account for why that client was reading more books. Could be that this particular client met some people who likes reading, and so they get together, they hang out with their friends, they read books. Could be that they found a series of books that they they actually enjoy. Maybe this person uh, came up with like, maybe they found the Harry Potter books. Now, that's a lot of books, of course, but you get the idea. Or maybe there was some other reward or some other variable in place. So comparison designs, they're really fantastic. They're very promising and you're very confident there. But a comparison design alone, an A-B design, cannot rule out other variables, time coincidences that could account for why that behavior increases. If you want some experimental control, if you want to demonstrate that your behavior changes when and only when treatment is put into place, you need something like a reversal design or a multiple baseline design. So with reversal designs, you strengthen your confidence that your treatment and only your treatment cause that change because unlike the comparison design, you actually take the treatment away. So you have baseline, naturalistic condition. You have a treatment condition where your intervention is in place and then you remove treatment to see if the behavior will go back to baseline levels. If when you take the treatment away, you see that the behavior returns to baseline levels, that's very compelling evidence that your intervention and only your intervention was the cause of the change. So let me show you. Here's a comparison design. So same again, we've got books read, uh, 0, 1, 2, 1, 1, 0. Then we put in the reward and we see six, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven. So pretty big, pretty big increase. There's no experimental control in this comparison design. Anything could have happened when that reward started. But instead, if we take away the treatment and we go back to a no reward baseline condition, and we see here that the number of books read goes from seven or eight down to two, three, two, one, one. We see it was low, got high, got low again. That behavior changed, or the number of books read changed when treatment was in place, and only when treatment was in place because we see the treatment was removed and it went back down. If I wanted more confidence, I could put in another treatment condition. So what I'm demonstrating here, low data in a baseline condition, high data in a treatment condition, low data in a baseline condition, high data in a treatment condition, low data again in a baseline condition. And I could just keep doing this forever. Put it in, take it out, put it in, take it out, and see if there's a corresponding change in the behavior. The whole reason that you do this kind of hokey pokey of experimental control is because you want to demonstrate that that behavior is changing when and only when treatment is put into place. And again, you need to demonstrate that the behavior is changing when treatment is put into place and it's changing only when that treatment is in place. And you can get that kind of experimental control with a reversal design. We also see in this reversal design, remember we see the behavior before treatment, we see what happens when we put the treatment into place, and then we see the behavior change again when we remove the treatment. This is fantastic because we're ruling out individual differences, we're ruling out time differences, so an individual difference is like a maturation difference. Um, maturation differences can be things like Maybe a client learns to walk, right? And if you have a comparison design, they're crawling, they're crawling, they're crawling, and then boop, suddenly they can walk. If that's the same time as the start of your treatment, you've got an individual difference there. Time differences are things that happen at the same time, an external confounding variable that just happen to be added. Because we can rule out both of those kinds of differences, these types of designs, time series designs like reversal design, and I'm going to come back to multiple baseline design, have very high internal validity. Internal validity is the extent to which we're confident that our treatment and only our treatment caused the behavior change. Unfortunately, these designs don't have very good external validity, which means that we can't necessarily generalize our results to other clients. And just a quick note here, when I talk about language here, this is important. The reversal 
in reversal designs refers to the fact that there's this third condition where we go back to the baseline condition. So we're reversing the environment to baseline, right? We are reversing the environment to baseline conditions. And I say that because sometimes when you take that treatment out, it's possible the behavior maintains because it came into contact with something in the environment that's maintaining it that we don't control. So there's no guarantee that when you take that treatment away, that behavior is going to go back to baseline levels, which is why the reversal has nothing to do with the behavior of the client. The reversal has everything to do with what's going on in the environment. The fact that behavior may not reverse to baseline levels is also the big weakness of a reversal design. In a reversal design, it's possible that some behaviors you either can't or won't be able to change. So for instance, if I teach someone social skills, and those social skills allow them to chat people up, to make friends, to hang out with people, it's very unlikely that anything that I do to teach those social skills, if I take it away, they're gonna keep using those social skills. So the reversal design is really good for uh, behaviors where it's very con uh, contingency dependent, it's very controlled by the environment itself, but these can be terrible. Your experimental control can be completely shot if the behavior is what we call irreversible, which means it could maintain on its own, or if it's something that you can't ethically remove. Like if I'm teaching someone safe needle sharing practices and I put treatment in, I can't take away the safe needle sharing practices. I can't give them dirty needles again to see if they're going to use dirty needles. That's what a monster would do. So in those circumstances, when you cannot reverse, you may want to use something like a time, or excuse me, like a multiple baseline design. A multiple baseline design, remember, is, is for when we have irreversible behaviors, like you can't unlearn how to do something, when the environment may be maintaining that behavior, like in the social skills, or if when removing the intervention would do harm to the participant, and only a monster would do that. The reason that we call this a multiple baseline design is because we have more than one baseline. We're tracking multiple participants, multiple behaviors, or even multiple settings in a multiple baseline design. So I'm showing you on screen here a demonstration, it's a little bit woolly, of three different participants. On the y-axis, the left axis, we're tracking whatever the dependent variable is, and we're tracking it across time. And generally speaking, we have low values in the baseline conditions. And then as treatment is added, and treatment is added at different times, we see that when and only when that treatment is added, do we see an increase in the response. So let's take a second here and pause. Remember, we want experimental control. That means behavior changes when and only when the treatment is added. So let me show you what that looks like here. And I'm gonna just do a little bit of drawing on screen and try to walk you through. Remember in the baseline conditions, we have kind of low data. And what we're seeing here is that when treatment goes into effect, indicated here on screen, uh, after about five conditions or five observations, excuse me, for the first participant, there's an automatic, just a boop, it just pops right up at about triples in the frequency of the behavior. Now, when treatment started here for this participant, we see an increase. But remember, we need to see when and only when. So we see that treatment changes when, or behavior changes when treatment went into effect here. But we have to, at the same time, see that the behavior for the subsequent or other baselines remains relatively unchanged, right? So we see that behavior changes when treatment goes into effect. But for the other baselines where treatment has not started, we have to see that it remains unchanged. And that's how we demonstrate experimental control. Behavior changes when treatment starts for the first participant, but it remains unchanged for participants who haven't yet gone into treatment. Let me give you an example of what is not a multiple baseline design. So this is an example of something that looks misleadingly like a multiple baseline, but isn't. A multiple baseline design has to have many critical features. One, you have to have multiple behaviors, multiple settings, multiple uh, dependent variables that you're tracking. But the second critical feature is that you have to stagger the start of treatment for one baseline and not the other. And remember, in a multiple baseline design, what we want to see is that the behavior changes when and 
only when the treatment goes into effect. So if you don't have a period of time where the baseline for one uh, receives treatment, but the baseline for the next hasn't yet started treatment, if you can't see that it changed when and only when treatment begins, you don't really have a multiple baseline design. This is best described as two comparison designs because we don't have the staggered start of treatment. So word of warning, remember, you have to see that treatment starts when and only when, as I'm showing you here on screen, we're seeing that it changes when treatment goes into effect and only when treatment goes into effect. If you have something like this, if you have something like this, the treatment doesn't start at different times for each of the subsequent baselines, and this is really just a trap. Remember, multiple behaviors, multiple people, multiple settings, and you have to stagger the start of treatment by at least one of those baselines by three observations so that we have time to see that the behavior changes when and only when treatment goes into effect. Why that magic number three? Well, it's because three points make a trend, and we want to demonstrate that there was a trend that the behavior remained unchanged. Let me know if you guys have any questions. This stuff is pretty complex, so stick around. I'm going to show you one more advanced single subject design, one of my favorites. I'll see you guys next time.